ghosts. Now there's a topic everybody knows at least a little about. There are believers and skeptics and the happy fence straddlers who just can't make up their minds if ghosts are real or not. Me? Well, since becoming an adult, most days I believe in absolutely nothing. I mean that literally. There's nothing out there but us, and when we die, it goes dark. There's a ceasing to exist and nothing more. No good, no bad, no feelings, no thoughts. Well, hell, on those days, I don't even believe in whales and sharks. I've never seen one in real life, so how do I know they're real? It's that kind of harsh disbelief that makes life a little easier to cope with at times. And some of you will understand that, others will not. Then I have that other kind of day. That the days when I believe in everything. Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, angels, demons. <laughs> Garden gnomes that run amok through the night causing chaos in the neighborhood. Werewolves, banshees, vampires, and of course, ghosts. Maybe most of all, ghosts. Now, younger me believed in everything all the time, but I also didn't think any of the supernatural things could hurt me. It was childish innocence that allowed me that privileged thinking. I grew up in a family that thrived on storytelling, so it was all entertainment. And since there were stories told by the older generations, great-grandparents and grandparents mostly, I sort of thought they all had happened in the far distant past, and nothing like that could really happen in my life. It was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> well, that's how all the good ghost stories start out. But it wasn't a dark and stormy night when I had my first experience. It was actually a bright, sunny, warm summer day. I was outside in the shade of our house with the back against the wall as I watched the wind blow through the trees. The trees swayed gently, and I imagined they were dancing to some song only they could hear. We had new neighbors on the hill above ours, but I would yet to meet them. There was a wire fence about four feet tall that separated our properties, and while I watched, the wind twisted the tall grass in and out of the fence, growing in intensity until it flipped twigs and debris against the wire. Then it stopped. Everything was silent. When I heard the little girl's voice from around the side of the house, I was a little startled at the sudden break in silence, but it didn't scare me. The neighbors probably had a kid, I thought. She called my name again and I yelled to her that I was in the backyard. Then she started singing my name to some tune I thought I should know, but I couldn't place as she dragged a stick along the fence. I was confused. I realized, if she was the neighbor's kid, how did she know my name? We hadn't met. I turned to stand as she came into view, stopping in a semi-crouched position I tried to force my 12-year-old brain to decipher what I was seeing, and I couldn't. The girl had blonde hair pulled up into a long ponytail, with an equally long white ribbon tied around it. She wore a pale blue dress with a white pinafore over it. Her shoes were white patent leather, and her socks were white with lace ruffle around the tops. She sang my name, but... She didn't look at me. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Sing-songy. Just like a little kid's meaningless tune, I guessed. I'm right here, I said as I finished standing, dusting my hands. She never turned toward me. It was a kind of a white powdery substance falling from her shoulders and trailing behind her a little ways before fading into nothing. A few inches in front and behind, where the stick touched the fence, I could clearly see a wooden fence appear, then disappear as she was moving along. I rubbed my eyes and called to her again, wondering why she didn't hear me, 
and why I was seeing what I was seeing. Skipping along, she kept her even, light pace, and though the fence rode a steep hill toward the woods, she kept on going. She would run into the corner of the fence at the wood line. I watched and listened as she neared it. The sing-songy tune stopped. She stopped. And I held my breath. She turned her head to look at me over her shoulder. Giggled. Covered her mouth. And then vanished as she darted for the woods. Right through the fence. Later that day, I asked my mother about the new neighbors, told her what had happened. She said that they had no kids. I had no explanation, but that experience was just the beginning for me. For the next two years, I would have the distinct impression someone was standing close to me when I was completely alone. At first, it wasn't a terrifying feeling, only a sense that the room wasn't empty. Then, it progressed to the point of being scary feeling as if the presence wanted to harm me. By the end of the two years, my name was being whispered in my ear at odd and completely random times, sometimes at school, but mostly at home. I learned to cope, you see, to push back my natural instinct to jump or yelp when it happened. If I didn't, everyone would have thought I was crazy. And it progressed so gradually that learning to cope with worse and worse situations became easier. Now, when I was 14, my mother took a second shift job. My father worked until after dark during the warm months, and my older brother had already married and moved out. I was home alone from one in the afternoon until after dark. The new neighbors had moved out, and their house stood empty above me and it was the only other home in the isolated hollow. The isolation was enough to give me the heebie-jeebies for the first week or two, but the weird ghostly experiences had let up, and I soon adjusted to being alone every single day. Mom had made sure my time was filled with chores during the summer. <laughs> now looking back, I think she gave me a chore list as a way to keep my mind occupied. She had seen the change in me, and I had told her a little bit about what I was experiencing. Always, she was adamant that it was only my overactive imagination getting the best of me. She did restrict my chores to household tasks, stating she didn't want me outside by myself. I understood the concern and the dangers of where we lived. Even as a teenager, I obeyed. One day, again, bright and sunny in the middle of the summer, I was doing laundry. I took clothes from the dryer in the hallway and lugged them to my bed where I would fold them before putting them away. All the blinds in the house were open, so there were no dark corners where shadows could set off my imagination. Not that I was thinking about it that day, I was thinking only of getting done with the chores so that I could read a book. I tossed the second armful of clothes to the bed, and my touch lamp blinked on the dimmest setting. And I froze. Nothing more happened. In my logical way, I rationalized that the static electricity from the clothes had somehow turned it on when I passed close to it. I mean, that had to be it. I touched the lamp three consecutive times and it went off. Turning my radio on low, I hummed along with a song as I folded clothes. Twice, I turned to the doorway at my back to see if someone was there. I could feel eyes on me and the bad vibes gave me chills. Each time, I put on my brave face and returned to the diminishing pile of clothes. Reading while flopped on my bed became impossible after several minutes. My mind kept conjuring creeping hands and grave-worn faces that lurked under the bed. A monster just lying in wait for me to relax and dangle a foot over the side for it to grab. Scaring myself out of the room, I went to the kitchen and sat facing the sliding door. The view was great. The flat of our front yard, 
the gravel drive spiraling down the hill, the two-acre tobacco field below, and the uprush of the mountains opposite of us. It was a grand view that inspired awe and respect in me. It soothed me. Then the feeling of being watched returned. Squaring my shoulders, I stood and turned toward the long hallway. I strove bravely back toward my room at the end of the hall, determined to prove there was nothing there to be afraid of. As soon as I stepped into the room, the lamp turned on again. I was twelve feet from it. While my brain groped for some logical explanation, the lamp brightened, brightened again, and then went dark. I wasn't so brave then, but I refused to give in to my panic. I turned to walk back to the kitchen, the only room that didn't cause a claustrophobic reaction. Facing the hallway, I calmed my breathing and my racing heart. Again, my mind latched on to the idea of static electricity. But then I saw a light flashing against my open door. Dim, bright, brighter, and then gone. It repeated. It had to be the switch malfunctioning, or so I thought. It can only shore out and catch the house on fire if I didn't unplug it. With a new, real-world worry taking hold, I moved quickly to the room, ducked down and yanked the plug from the wall socket. Breathing hard, I backed away from the lamp as if it were a rabid dog. But everything was fine. Even the sensation of being watched disappeared. An hour later, the end of cycle signal on the dryer went off. It was the last thing I had to do for the day. I was thinking about which TV show I would watch when I took the clothes into my room and dumped them on the bed. Before the last towel hit the bed, the damn lamp went crazy. Dim, brighter, brighter off. It did this several times in just a few seconds and stopped on the brightest setting. The cord was still where I had dropped it on the floor. As I backed toward the door, completely terrified, it started up again. This time, I heard a man's deep laughter echoing from somewhere distant. The lamp tilted and I ran down the hallway, meaning to grab the phone from the wall. Heavy, thudding footsteps gave chase and I didn't dare look back. Someone had been in the house with me. Hitting the sliding door, I fought the lock, flung the door wide and fell out of the door onto my knees onto the porch. The heavy footsteps were rounding the table and closing in. I scrambled, screaming for the screen door. The footfalls were on the porch. I pinwheeled down the steps and into the gravel, flipped over to finally face the madman. There was nothing there porch was screened, so I had a view of the whole thing. When I could stand again, I edged to where I could see through the open sliding door. I didn't see anything. I could see the clock on the wall above the pantry cabinet. Four o'clock. Four hours to go before anyone would be home. M moving a little farther... I could see the phone hanging on the wall on the other side of the kitchen with its stupid 25-foot curly cord all knotted and dangling above the trash can. Oh, I don't know why my parents hadn't switched over to cordless phones. One of those would have been easier to snag and run with. But with the ancient wall-mounted one, I would have to dial while standing at the beginning of the hallway. The cord would only reach a couple of feet outside the sliding door. Whatever had chased me could get to me if I had tried to do that. Now out of options, I stayed outside on the gravel. I didn't even work up enough courage to go close to the sliding door. I mean, besides, what use was that? Something was already in there. Closing the door was a pointless action. And I was okay until the sun started to drop toward the West Mountain. Back here, there are night critters which 
you don't want to encounter without a weapon. Coyotes are abundant here. They're not afraid of humans. Especially wimpy, skinny little 14-year-olds. Bears are another common night animal here. Not as common as coyotes, but who really wants to be outside and risk running into one? My only solace came from a single street light near the fence. It buzzed to life as the sun said its final goodbye, and I stood just inside the circle of light, completely torn. Should I be brave enough to go back inside, or at least to the semi-safety of the porch? Nothing had happened in hours. The house had been silent since I'd come out. But looking into the foreboding darkness of the house, I simply could not muster the bravery to go inside. I crept closer to the street light's pull. The light whitewashed the gravels, the grass near the fence, and the scrub brush just on the other side. If anything moved, I would see it. Moving closer to the pole, I sent up silent prayers that my dad would get home soon. I watched in the distance for his headlights, willing them to appear as I rested my back against the splintery wood. Tree frogs and crickets joined in the nighttime symphony, drowning out the world. Instead of bringing a smile to my face, though, the noise made me edgy. I couldn't hear if something were creeping stealthily toward me in the darkness outside my circle of light. Turning constantly, trying to see everywhere at once. I was soon so scared I was sick and sweating. And that's when I heard a familiar little girl's voice somewhere in the distance singing my name again. Goosebumps crawled from the back of my head to the tops of my feet. The sound drew closer and I spun toward the fence and there was a little blonde girl in the blue dress. She was facing away from me, singing my name in that eerie, lilting, kiddish melody. Hoarsely, I whispered, Go away, please, go away. My throat was full of needle-prick pains as I forced the words out. She giggled, shook her head, and turned so I could see her profile. The white powdery substance wafted from her as it had before, momentarily glittering like dew under the light. Her voice, high and sweet, echoed as if she spoke from the belly of a cave. Let's play, Aaron. And I shook my head, moved toward the outer edge of the light in tiny baby steps. I couldn't trust my legs to hold up if I did more than scoop my feet under the gravels. Before I could take a breath, she flickered out like a light and reappeared with her hand clutching mine like a little sister would do if her big brother was helping to her across the street. She smiled up at me, and the world went topsy-turvy. I was going to pass out. Well, quite honestly, I hoped to pass out. Then I was at the fence the little girl still holding my hand. Let's play tag. She let go of my hand and tapped the center of my chest. You're it, she squealed happily. I, most certainly, was not it. I broke into a run for the porch. To hell with whatever was in there. At least, it hadn't touched me. I hit the screen door full force and bounced off of it back to the ground. It had been like hitting a brick wall. The girl stood at the outer edge of the light ten feet from me. Her expression melted into a mask of a child in the middle of a tantrum. With her hands on her hips, she glared at me with crystalline blue eyes that seemed to admit their own low light. Don't make me come and get you. I said, let's play tag. You're it. Her voice had lost the echoing quality along with the sweet high pitch of an innocent childhood. Not seeing any visible reason the screen door shouldn't be open, I vaulted toward it again and began to thrash at it, keeping an eye on the girl. Another scream rose in my throat as I had given in to the panic, and I yelled prayers and profanities in equal measure. 
The girl stepped to the edge of the light, and as her feet crossed into the shadow, the white patent leather turned dark, moldy, and torn within a heartbeat. Then her hands crossed over. Porcelain perfect skin flaked up like old lead paint, peeled away and evaporated leaving exposed weathered bones. The dress eroded into dark tatters that fluttered as she paced toward me. Alabaster's skin seemed to scorch from her face and drift upward in a dark plume of smoke, and her shining blonde hair hung knotted, matted, and askew as if the scalp had slipped to one side. The darkly grinning skeletal face tried to speak, but the tongue bloated, blackened, and fell out. She crushed it underfoot as she made her way steadily toward the steps. My screams redoubled off the mountains. The crickets and tree frogs fell silent, and the only sound was my screaming. Sinking my fingers into the screen, I ripped at it until I managed to clear away a patch large enough for me to crawl through. Pedaling my feet against the boards, I pushed backward away from the door where she was now coming through. I screamed harder when headlights washed over me. I turned to see my dad's truck, and I looked back to the door. There was only a ragged hole torn in the screen. She was gone. My dad, he tried his best, but he couldn't console me. I was in a full-blown meltdown mode by the time he reached me. He couldn't even get me in the house. I think my actions scared him as badly as the ghost girl had scared me. Even after I would settled, he couldn't get me in the house farther than the kitchen. He was a complete skeptic and I don't think he ever really believed any of my story. He was sympathetic to a point, but, well, that was it. My mother was a bit more understanding. She at least arranged for me to stay with my aunt during the days my dad picked me up in the evenings. The next year, well, we moved to another house. Things went back to normal. I finished school got married, and eventually had a couple of really good kids of my own. All those years, and nothing out of the ordinary, until my first granddaughter turned four. She just told my wife last week that she loves staying with us, because she likes to play with the little singing girl. <laughs>